Hello, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Benjamin Renault. I'm the senior director of engineering for uh, a new project that we have in our um, cloud environment. It is um, really a mobile and cloud-focused application, and it is something that we're not talking about per se in this context today. What I want to talk about today is the a novel um, process that we are bringing to, in the Cisco context at least, that I've been practicing for a number of years um, in the context of startups for developing and deploying um, clouds to uh, applications to the cloud. So this is a uh, it's a refinement on a process that people often um, you know, talk about, which is agile, and it's really sort of sometimes we talk about it as being super agile. It is um, a very dynamic, very uh, fast way of delivering cloud apps. So when people ask me about you know what is what is agile, um, and I tell, you know, sometimes tell them agile is a little bit like juggling, in the sense that you can sort of learn it from a book. You won't get good at it until you actually practice it for a while. And the proof of that was, was given to me by a professor that actually um, you know, sat down one day with us uh, at school and said, do you guys think that you can learn anything from a book? And this was you know, a bunch of freshmen and everybody said, yes, yes, we all think we can actually learn anything from reading. So he gave us a sheet about how to juggle, and these were the steps. And sure enough, you know, it obviously takes practice to actually do it. The key point is you ultimately want to figure your own style out. You'll hear a lot about agile development, about, well, you have to have you know, a scrum meeting every day, and it has to be this long, and you have to have a scrum master or a product owner, or you have to have sprints, and it's got to look like this. And the reality is these are just suggestions, and you really need to adopt them um, to your own circumstances, your own working style, and practice it, and evolve it. The most important thing about Agile, in my, in my, in my, you know, in, 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 in my mind, is to make sure that you adapt it to your own way of working. That is the most important thing about it. Make sure that, that you figure out your own style. So as I said, what we do is called continuous delivery. Some people call it super Agile. It uses a lot of the same ideas, and it is um, really, I look at it as being one step beyond. Agile really tries to bring down the deployment cadence to once every sprint, which you know can be anywhere from two weeks to three weeks, which is still much, much better than what we've seen with Waterfall, which can take you know three months, six months, even nine months. But what we do here is really try to bring it down to one day or a few hours. So I'll talk about that. So let me start with cloud-based applications. I mean, you know, this is really restating the obvious. Cloud-based applications really have two key components. A cloud, which is a bunch of applications and processes running into some data center somewhere. And that data center may be um, controlled by you know, your own data center, or it may be running on Rackspace, on Amazon, on you know, any, any of the public uh, PaaS providers. And those are clients. And they're talking to each other. And that's really the essence of cloud app. So you think about the software that's running in the cloud app, you can think of it as being you know, all the processes that are running here. They might be writing, you know, writing written in Java, in Python, or, or whatever. Um, and all the client software, which may be sort of you know, desktop applications, web applications, iOS, Android applications, Blackberry, Windows Global, you name it. All that software is what you're talking about when you're talking about a SaaS application. And when you're talking about agile and continuous delivery, you're talking about doing continuous delivery across that entire set of applications. So why is it that the cadence at which you deploy software matter? Well, it matters because there's a whole bunch of reasons. And I got this one, guys, so I'm going to use it. First, it is your rate of innovation. 
how quickly you can bring out new features is how quickly you can innovate. I like to say one of the things that we like to do is we'll discuss a feature at launch, and that afternoon we deploy it, and it's in customers' hands. That's one of the most satisfying feelings as a software developer that you can possibly have. So it dictates the rate of innovation. That's really important. It's important competitively. It's important in your own group's morale. It's important in all kinds of ways. Um, it responds on how well you can respond to customer requests. If a customer tells you, you know, I would like X, Y, or Z, or in a competitive bid situation, or anything like that, that just tells you how quickly you can get the, the, the feature in there. You can address defects. Obviously, customer requests, customer reports. Um, whoa, what happened here? I pressed on the wrong button. Sorry. There we go. All right. Security vulnerabilities. Obviously, these you know these occur uh, in the cloud. People find them. How quickly can you address it? Address it. And this is, doesn't just apply to the cloud, right? We talked about the cloud before. The cloud is your cloud apps, and it's your clients. So all of this applies to clients as well, not just the cloud applications. And I'll talk about that. So in order to really get there, what are the two essential things that you need? And that's automation and mindset are really the two most important things. Automation is really important because people, people are slow. When you trust people to run a bunch of tests, it takes forever. And sometimes they make mistakes. Automation, you can run it. You can run it in the middle of the night. You can run it whenever you need to. And if you do a good job, it will be very repeatable. And as you find bugs, you fix them, they don't come back. You want to make sure, but they don't come back. So you need really good testing, and you need really good deployment. I'll get back to testing. I'll get back to deployment in a minute. But you also need mindset. You need mindset because, you know, in the traditional again waterfall methodology, which by the way, has created tons of wonderful software that we're all using today. But in the traditional waterfall methodology, a developer writes, you know, a feature throws it over the wall to QA, QA tries it out, throws it over the wall to either operations in a SaaS environment or you know shipping for people that are that are that are that are doing on-prem software or hardware. Manageable that are not measurable, that are not operable. And it will end up costing you a lot of um, causing you a lot of pain. So let me sort of step back to one of the things that that, that is different about this. Um, I often tell people, we have no QA. And they look at me and they're like, you have no QA? This is crazy. How do you, how do, you do QA? All of our developers write tests. So you write a feature, and that feature isn't done until you've written the feature functionality. You've written a test for it. That test is fully automated. You have metrics, and you have operability features. So proper logging, proper start, stop, semantics, whatever it is that you need, needs to be part of your, um, of your feature. So whenever a developer writes a piece of code, they write a test. That's always true. You need to enforce that very strongly as a discipline. People often say, well, you know, some tests are too hard to write. That's why we're going to revert back to manual. As soon as you do that, you put yourself in a position of not being able to deploy. Because before you can deploy, you can make sure, you've got to make sure that it works. You've got to be able to test it. So if you not, need to do it manually, these things accumulate. You end up with a bunch of manual tests. You lose the flexibility that you gain by going for continuous delivery in the first place. Especially if it's a UI. People talk about, well, UIs are hard to test. Well, they're good, there are very good frameworks out there to do that. And you need to use them, especially if it's on the client. Again, people use the client as sort of one of those things that's hard to test. Yes, it is, but that's why it's important to do it. The key point about having developers write tests is that really good tests are hard to write, 
and they require a level of development that is as skilled as the development of features. And that's just, that is just a truism. So people that write sort of silly tests that just do, you know, get, set, you know, kind of the, the silly unit tests, that we, no one needs that. What you need are smart, solid tests written by smart people that are able to actually test these features. So those tests, as I said, must be automated, self-cleaning. Any data that they create needs to be erased by the time that you actually clean, you know, when you, you, you terminate it, even if it fails. And runnable easily individually by developers so that people that are able, so that you are able to actually run tests locally on your own machine before you push it out to, to integration. That's not always possible, but if it is at all possible, you should make it happen. And by the way, guys, if you have any, uh, any questions as I go along, feel free to you know, raise your hand, and I'll be happy to take them, take them in stride. Um, this is really, really important, because a solid set of integrated tests is the only way that you can get the confidence to deploy whenever you want. You have your cloud application. It's running in production. You press a button, and you deploy. The only way you can do that is if you have a comprehensive test suite that you're confident in. Yes? Our, yes, is there, so the question is, is there an example of a smart test versus a dumb test? Well, I, I'll give you some examples of dumb test or dumb documentation, uh, which is sort of the same kind of thing. You see sometimes people will do that to get their, number, their, their coverage numbers up. So you get them, you know, the classic one is there's a setter and a getter. You get, you know, set foo, get foo. Documentation, sets foo, gets foo. Yeah, okay, that's, that's not really useful. Um, the test is sets it, gets it, make sure that it actually returns the same thing. Those setters and getters are just, you know, hiding your field. There's no real point, there's no functionality there. There's no, that's not interesting. Uh, interesting test would be something like uh, testing concurrency. So you have a module, there's a method, and you, you know, that method has to be thread safe. How do you test that? That's hard. I mean, you, know, you need to you know, spin up a bunch, of, a bunch of threads, make sure that you have timing right so you really are testing what you're trying to test. Um, those are the kinds of, you know, that would be a smart test versus a dumb test, um, as an example. Some of the very um, hard problems that we deal with, and as you know, in, is testing video and audio quality. So in collaboration, of course, we do a lot of video and audio. You know, when you have a product like WebEx, for example, um, you have to be able to say, what is my video quality? Uh, what is my audio quality? So for audio quality, you know, and, and the best measure for all of this is always MOS scores, which are user scores, but they're human driven. What you really want is you want to be able to come up with ideas on how do you test video quality. Well, that's a hard problem. That's an app. That's a feature. So you, know, you come up with ideas like, for example, um, you generate a 3D, uh, one of those uh, you know, um, uh, code, the QR codes. right? You send that over. On the other end, you check the QR code. You've verified that you get the right value. That gives you some sense of what the video quality is going to be like. Other things that we've done is uh, there's face recognition software on Android and iOS. So you send the face over the video. You do face recognition 3,000 times on some number of frames. If it works, that means you have a pretty good video. Um, so you've got to be smart and creative about how you, you solve these problems. The key point here is if tests pass, we feel confident in deploying. That is really the most important thing. The second most important thing is if something went wrong, we detect it quickly. And I'll get back to that in a second. So uh, we run our tests all the time. Um, you know, on every check-in, we run the test every morning, regardless of how many check-ins there have been. These days, we have 200 people in the team, so there's always been something checked in. But back in the days, you know, sometimes you know, when we're, there were 15 of us, Maybe there was nothing checked in. We'll still run it just to make sure that everything's, everything's working. Um, if the build breaks, 
or the deployment pipeline breaks, fixing that is the number one priority for the whole team because it blocks everyone else. Um, in theory, it doesn't really block everyone else, but it blocks you from actually being able to deploy out to the cloud. So that's a, it's a very important thing. Uh, these days, we actually do a variation on this. And I won't get into details. But basically, before you check in can make it to master, it has to pass all the tests. So we will create an integration branch automatically. We'll test that against master. Like it's we'll do all the integration tests. If the integration test pass, then we'll check into master. So essentially, master always stays clean because it's enforced. We obviously run tests before uh, we deploy. And we actually reuse the tests in operations. So every single test that we have, we package up as an app that we give to operations and that they run continuously against the production application. This is how we make sure that the app doesn't break in production. Now, this is on top, of course, of all the standard monitoring that you might do, making sure processes are up, you don't get, you know, you don't get memory leaks or things like that. But this is a very important component of it. When I went back, when I talked about self-cleaning, this is what this enables, because you don't go and mess up the production database with dirty data. So let me go now to deployment mechanics. Um, this is sort of a, this is an essential part of it. So you've gone from release engineering to deployment into your cloud. It is absolutely imperative that everything that happens for deployment be automated from beginning to end. What I've always told, what I always tell people is, what I tell my deployment guys is, I want you to press a button and on a virgin OpenStack environment, deploy an entire new application from scratch. So it's interesting because the, the, and the other day, we actually, you know, we, 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 we've been planning on deploying to um, a data center over in uh, Europe. And we actually, we procured the contracts with the folks over in, in Europe to get, you know, the, the, the facilities and the open stack environment. We literally, literally pressed a button and we had the entire application running over in Ireland like that. So this is absolutely essential. It's essential for a bunch of reasons. First of all is speed. So you can quickly create environments that you can test against. You can get overflow environments. You can, get, you can never get into a state where somebody deploys an environment. Somebody sees a problem with the environment. One of the operators goes in, logs into a machine, makes a bunch of changes, fixes the, whatever problem it is. I'll give you an example. You know, we've had, in our WebEx environment, we've had some folks sometimes go in there and say, um, you know, realize that a machine was running out of file descriptors. Instead of changing the script that would set the file descriptor limit for all machines from that point on, they just went in there and up the file descriptor thing on that machine. Next time that machine gets rebooted, of course, you lose all that and you know you run into the problem again. If that person quit, you lose the knowledge that this is actually what you needed to do. Um, so everything's got to be, and there's a bunch of really great tools to do that today, things like Puppet um, and Chef, um, and really so make use of them. Um, obviously, you know, you got to do, you know, we do daily deploys. We actually do twice daily deploys these days. Um, we do zero downtime. The way that we do it is, you know, we bring up an entire new application every single time we do anything. Everything, from the router down to the database. Um, we test that new app. So this is, you know, this is up to like 400 VMs. Um, we test the new app. When it's good, we have the gateway just switch over the, route, the, 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 the traffic, and now we have a new app running. About 10 minutes. Uh, what we also is we actually keep, we keep the old app around in case something goes terribly wrong with a new app, so we can switch back to the old app very quickly. 
Um, for that, we actually need to do something a little bit, um, we are a little bit careful about that. So the changes that require schema changes on the database are special. So those we isolate, because that is the one where you cannot go back very quickly, because you're going to break everything. So um, we mark those as being, when there was, there's something like that, there's a developer sets a flag saying, might change changes the schema. We detect that, and we're careful that that's a, that's a, so this is, so that's the way we actually do, we do deployment. So a couple of other, you know, I've already talked about master. Master is always clean, always ready to deploy. The whole deployment pipeline that I described before is dealt with exactly like any piece of production because our ability to fix any problem in production is gated on that pipeline working. If it doesn't work, we can't fix problems. So the pipeline is broken. People get paged in the middle of the night to go fix it. Um, I won't get into that. That's a lo little bit of a, it's just too detailed. So I, I mentioned, you know. Oh, yeah, we take turns deploying. So one of the things that we do is we want anyone to be able to deploy. So we actually rotate deployment responsibilities. Uh, up until recently, I was actually deploying myself. Um, and just, you know, like you, go into the, you go into Jenkins, you select what you want, you start running the script, you check the log. If something goes red, somebody will get paged. But anyone can do it. So I already talked about all this. Um, let me talk about clients. The web, of course, introduced the first always up-to-date client, right? You go to the page, you deploy, redeploy the page from the server, you get the new client, everything's fine. And that's great. Of course, we've seen the new desktop clients and obviously mobile clients are coming back into Vogue because they're powerful, they're easy to use. And the question is, what do you do with them? Um, and the answer there is you really, really need to do the exact same thing that you do with your server side applications and keep them up to date as frequently as you can. So we push new mobile apps as often as the App Store allows us. And it's very clear that the trend for iOS and, uh, and Android is to come up with, is to go to automated updates. So they're, they're working on that, they're making that happen, and this is, this is really, really good. Um, on desktop applications, we actually have a great deal more flexibility. We can push updates whenever we want. I put this little thing here, and for those of you that use Chrome, how many people know what version of Chrome they're running? No one knows. It's because they keep updating behind the scenes. You don't know. So the ability to do that with desktop applications actually really, is actually really great. One of the, it's actually one of the very interesting things, by the way, and it's a little bit of a digression, but, that's great, uh, digression, but I, I'll, I'll mention it. Web applications were wonderful because they worked across all kinds of platforms and because they were always up to date, zero provisioning. Right, very easy to provision. You just go to your browser, you load your page, and boom, you have it. And of course, they had limited functionality. The great thing you're seeing now with things like Chrome, with things like Evernote, with things like Dropbox, is you get applications that are self-updating because they've built the shell around it to self-update, and that make full use of the network all the time. So you get the best of both worlds, really. So if you have the time and the energy to develop a desktop app, you should. And you can always, and you can make it self-updating. So that's a, that's a nice, nice feature of it. So other principles that we follow uh, is, you know, obviously a lot of iteration. Um, you get always developers, PMs, um, designers together in the same Scrum team. You also get, um, I didn't, I should have mentioned this here. Oh, yeah, I do, operations. So the ops guys are part of our Scrum teams. And they're all, you know, every, all of this is in my group. It's one group. And everybody works together. So when you develop, when you deploy a feature, you work on a feature, the operations piece has to be part of the story. Um, as I said, this is what we do. That doesn't have to be what you do. Um, and we do all this other, you know, nice, nice, nice features like A-B testing, experimental features, lots of metrics. 
Um, as I said, this, is, this methodology is compatible with Agile. It's just compressed uh, and has more automation. And Agile tends to rely more on people process. We like to rely more on automated process. OK, it's not perfect. It's not a panacea. It does have some real challenges. The first deploy is always hard. People love to sort of sit down, get an app ready, and just get it running. The, to do this right in this environment is much harder because you have to set up a development pipeline. You have to set up um, a lot of automated testing. Just getting to the hello world piece is just hard. It takes longer. So the velocity looks of a normal project might look like this. The velocity on a continuous delivery project looks more like that. Um, so that's the that's a big well, that's one of the big differences. Um, quick iteration and daily focus is important, but obviously you got to keep your eye on the ball and think about the larger project and prioritize accordingly. Um, the other stuff is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I really love this book. If you're interested in continuous delivery, it's by uh, Jess Humble and David Farley. Um, really, it's a, it's a great book that covers you know, much more than what I've talked about here today, um, but is, a, is really truly a, a, a great read if you're, if you're interested in software development and, and delivery. So, and with that, that's, uh, that's all I had for today, but uh, very happy to take some questions if uh, you guys have some. Please. Yes, uh, so I'll repeat the question. Um, so the lady is, is uh, writing an application using WebSockets and having trouble writing tests um, for WebSockets, presumably, I'm guessing on the client side more than on the server side. Um, and are there suggestions for, for writing tests? The key point here really is um, really general testing on your, so, you're dealing with two big problems. One is you need a framework on your clients to be able to run your test on your client, make sure that you get full functionality, full access to functionality on your client. For that, I've been, so I'm a huge fan of glass-to-glass -glass testing, which means essentially that one, app, one part of the app, the client is talking to the, talking to the cloud, and then either with the result back to the same client if they're doing a loop like that, or if it's a collaboration app, on the other client, like really test glass to glass. And what I mean by glass to glass is I mean device to device going through your production cloud. That is the best way to test. So you need a framework to test on your, on, on your device. So you're going to pick a good framework. You know, so Selenium is, you know, is good. There's a, Cucumber is another one. There's a whole set of frameworks. I don't know the exact ones that the guys are using right now, but pick the right one that works for you. And understand and script it really across the, you, know, you need to script it with what's happening on, your, on, your, on one device, on the server, and on the other device, and make sure that the whole thing just, just works. It's, really, it's hard. Uh, it's a lot of work. We actually have developers writing full time on frameworks to test exactly this sort of stuff. Um, one of my, so the two recommendations I would make is number one, make sure you pick the right framework for your clients. Number two, look at, um, there's a number of providers out there, like TestDroid, that run tests for you on all kinds of devices, on the actual devices. So they have warehouses filled with every version of Android ever created on every kind of hardware device platforms that they ever created, every version of the iPhones with you know, five or six different versions of iOS, Matrix, they have like literally ton, tons of those things. They're actual devices, and you send your, you send your, your test, and they run it. Um, we love those guys. They're, this is one of the best. And so they run it. You integrate that as part of your build and build process. And that's a, that really helps. Um, so I'm sorry if I didn't answer the thing on WebSockets exactly. But come to me afterwards. And I will put you in touch with some of the engineers on my team. And they'll be able to tell you, maybe uh, answer your question in more detail. Any, anything else?
Yes, so the question is, we do flag schema changes. Do we do anything special uh, before they go into the tree and before they go into, into production? Uh, yes. So schema changes are one of the, it's, um, it's the highest level of scrutiny that for code reviews. I didn't talk about code reviews, but we do those as well. Um, we, we, are, we, we have some level of flexibility with code reviews where we say, you know, either it's been reviewed or it's going to be reviewed. For schema changes, it has to be marked as a schema change. Um, and they, they get run, so th that deploy gets run as a special user because that user has the rights to go change Cassandra. And if you try to introduce a schema change that wasn't flagged that way, it would run as a user that is not allowed to change Cassandra, and it would fail. So that's one level of safety. So if somebody does this, does it, introduce a piece of code that somehow sneaks in, that's doing a schema change, it will actually fail right away because it, it, it won't have the, so you have to flag it so that it runs as a special user. As soon as it gets flagged, it won't actually go into master until it has had two levels of code reviews by a set of approved people. Um, and people look at it carefully. They figure out, is it a reversible schema change? Is it a compatible schema change? And then we treat it specially to, to do that. So we try to avoid those. When we do, we always try to make them, um, if we don't, we always try to avoid breaking. Like you never want to basically take out a field or do any, you add stuff and then, and then you, you, know, you, you, you make it, you add, you add fields as you need to. And then if once it gets to unwilly, you shift classes and you add a new class. But the old stuff's got to keep working because um, you, know, you don't want to break things. Only once you know for a fact that every client using the old schema hasn't shown up in three months can you feel comfortable taking out a class, for example, or taking out an object? So that's the, and that again goes back to metrics because you have to know which versions of your clients you have in the wild. And that's a metric that you need to be able to keep track of. How do you know when your tests are good enough? Uh, it's, there are a couple of ways of doing it. Um, unfortunately, one of them is, the most efficient one is to actually have a team of your architects, of your, of your heavyweights, just keep track of what's out there. And that's human driven and that's not that good. But it is unfortunately the best way. The second best way, which is really not good at all, is test coverage tools. Um, so test coverage tools will give you some sense of what you have for test coverage, but um, you need to be very cognizant of, it, of their limitations and what they mean. Once again, like, don't ever look at just the percentage. You really have to go into which lines of code are actually getting exercised. Um, they're terrible at dealing with dynamic content um, because dynamic content will create an unpredictable code path, and so you don't know what's really getting tested. So what you really want to do is, is, is use dynamic test coverages that, that will actually monitor which lines of code are actually getting exercised while your test is running. So if you do that, test coverage tools can be OK. Um, but it's really it's a cultural thing and a tooling thing. Yeah. Yes? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so the question is, um, can I expand a little bit on A-B testing? So we do A-B testing in a number of different ways. Um, the main way that we do it is um, we actually have communities of folks that are more tolerant of experimental features, um, generally speaking. That's sort of our first phase. That's the first sort of implementation of that. Um, we couldn't, we, so I should say. Um, so those groups get options on their, on their, in their app. In their preferences, you can go into options and you can say, I'm, I have experimental features I want to turn on, you know, whatever, like high quality video or uh, location-based services or whatever. And they'll use it for a while and that will give us some sense of, of how, you know, of how the, the feature gets used and how reliable it is, how well it works. The set of people is generally essentially my, it's essentially our, it's my group. 
uh, it's all my engineers, you know, PMs and so on, and they get to use it, um, plus my boss and my boss's boss. And those guys get to use the experimental features and, and we try it out for a while. That's one very simple way in which we do A-B testing. The other way that we do it is um, essentially, it's cohort-based, so you can actually say, um, based on certain demographics or certain user characteristics, so you're a very heavy user of the app. You get flagged as such because our metrics tell us that you're a very heavy user, or you're a European user, or you're a messaging-only user. You're not using video. Um, you never use video. Like you define your cohort in some way, and you say, that's my cohort. This is the, the group of users that I'd like to target. And then for those users, you serve them up a different thing. You give them a different feature. And you say, OK, uh, you're going to get you know, the new UX. So you're going to get something. You know, you're going to get a little hint, a little nudge that there's a video functionality, and you should check it out. Um, and then based on that, we look at whether or not user engagement changes uh, for that. So we can filter on cohort for measuring user engagement, and we figure that out. Um, and then the third way is to just do it randomly. So you select a cohort at the time that you start. 10% of the people get X, and then you want to measure. And those are random. And then you say, OK, what was the effect of like, on their behavior? Like, did they use the app more? Did they use the app less? Did they use this feature more, that feature less? And so on and so forth. So um, that's, that's how it works out. Typically, um, so cohorts definition, we try to make that. Right now, it's not easy to do it. So we need to get developers involved. Ideally, what I would want is I want a tool that would let the PMs actually do this. Um, so they can just manage it the way that they want. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's how it's done right now. Any, any other questions? Yes. That enables this. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so the question is, what, what about continuous delivery in a non-cloud context? And does it work there? And the answer is, that's much, much harder. Uh, you can in some ways. So for example, if you have, um, I talked about desktop applications. And desktop applications have, um, you know, if, if that's all you have, and there's no cloud service associated with, there's no server, um, you can update the application in the background and just keep, keep doing it. Even if that application, you have a, you have a desktop application or, or you know, a, lab, you know an applica a mobile application, and then you have a server component that's running on premises, you could potentially imagine that you would update and continually update and continually um, deploy on the on-premise server. That's conceivable. That's feasible. But generally speaking, it's more of a cultural question because People that deploy servers and hardware on premises, generally speaking, want to keep control on version. And they do not want to open up their network to outside management. So it's much harder to do in a, on a non premise context than it is in a cloud based context. Any other thoughts, questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs>